بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من دام النبي بعده السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, on short notice, I appreciate that uh, uh, our, those viewers who are able to uh, sign on and, and, and catch our, our live feed have uh, joined us this evening. Um, part of the uh, reason why we put this together is because of the fact that, I mean, the obvious fact of uh, the coronavirus and the COVID-19 really sort of occupying our lives, coming to um, our homes, our communities, our masajid, and uh, and so it's really the thing that's on everybody's mind. And I'll speak for myself. I know that I had a lot of questions myself. And yeah, despite being a mental health care professional, I'm not a primary health healthcare professional or or an epidemiologist uh, uh, by that by any stretch of the imagination. And so I was reaching out to you know others uh, to try to get more information. Uh, I reached out to, you know, we had several text exchanges with Mohan Bilal, with Dr. Fahad, with our staff here. We're having a lot of questions, trying to figure out what do we do, how do we understand what's going on. And so I thought, you know what, why don't we assemble um, a group of us uh, to come together uh, to really have a roundtable to discuss a lot of the things that are on people's minds. And so... Uh, so there were three elements of the um, of, of this um, sort of craze that's going on that I I figured would be uh, that's that's sort of sort of coming up. One of it is like the healthcare, the medical aspect of it. What is it? What are the symptoms? The signs? The prognosis? What's going on? What's the future of this? Uh, who is vulnerable? Who's not? Who can be infected? Who can't be? Um, and then there's the aspect of it, which is psychological, right? And, uh, and, that, and that's the aspect of this fear and contagion of fear and panic that's been uh, really going around. It's really hard to find toilet paper, right? <laughs> <laughs> in most places of, in, in, in the country, I can say that I, I went out shopping myself <laughs> for, for some, uh, despite the fact that it's not, you know, uh, uh, fault to use it, <laughs> right? Um, and um, and then there's the spiritual dimensions of it. Uh, the uh, how do we as Muslims respond to it? Um, do we go to Juma? Do we not go to Juma? Um, you know, what are the amal uh, that we're supposed to be doing? The the religious kind of litanies and and, and actions and rituals that we should be uh, practicing. Are there precedents in the lives of the companions of the, uh, in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Um, how do we make sense of this? Um, and what do we do about it uh, as, as Muslims? Is this a divine punishment? Is this a uh, blessing in disguise? Um, so all of these questions really arise. And I thought we should really have an interdisciplinary uh, group of us come together to have this exchange. And so on my right, we have Maulana Bilal, who uh, um, sits on the chair of the board of directors at Khalil Center, uh, as well as the uh, head of the Department of Hadith Studies at uh, Dar al-Qasim, uh, and my teacher as well at Dar al-Qasim. Um, we have Dr. Uh, Asim uh, Padella, who's an emergency uh, medicine uh, physician. Um, he's also the head of the Initiative on Islam and Medicine at the University of Chicago. And he's a, a bioethicist, and he's joined us. Um, and we have Dr. Summer uh, Harfi, who's uh, you know our very own psychologist here at Khalil Center, um, who's also joined us to help us uh, kind of, uh, you know, unravel some of the layers of the psychology of some of this uh, together. So I want to start off just by asking each of you what your experience with this whole thing has been. I mean, you know, on the one hand, um, we're all, uh, you know, healthcare providers or, 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 or spiritual leaders that we uh, have, you know, positions of authority and, and leadership where we have to kind of care for others. But then there's also the real human aspect of it uh, behind the scenes. And, and um, while we're trying to you know, come out on a Friday evening, I imagine that throughout the course of the day, we're trying to juggle our own lives and try to uh, figure out how we tackle uh, this, uh, this crisis um, at the same time. So if we start with um, yourself, I know that I heard that you were maybe uh, possibly going to be in social isolation today. Or... <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the uncertainty that, that um, has, has sort of 
emerged in the last two, three days is, is like quite surprising. But it's, I think it's very encouraging to see that there was mobilization of uh, religious authorities, uh, physicians. Um, there were quick conversations and quick turnaround uh, in terms of producing documents and, and, and also um, um, sending out messages to the community as to how to cope with, um, you know, Thursday morning, the discussion starts by Thursday night, messages are being sent to the messages, that's what two recommendations are being made. Um, so that was very positive, and it mm -hmm. seems like we're preemptively trying to, uh, to, to address the question. Um, but I think that the, the nature of the, uh, the, the virus, the disease, as well as the, um, the fact that Baun or you know, general affliction type of disease is like this, um, we haven't experienced in our lifetime. Right. I haven't. I don't know if I've ever experienced anything of this nature in my life. And I think even my parents' generation may not have experienced some of it uh, in their lives as well. Um, so to see to see something like this, um, the advantage is that it, it, it's gotten me to open up books I don't think I would have opened up mm -hmm. otherwise, um, including texts on uh, Ta'un and Waba and, you know, and defining the differences between various terms that are used, which we can't really easily translate into a particular type of plague or mm -hmm. disease, infectious disease. Or pandemic. Pandemic, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Right. all these types of terms. And so it's opening up, I think, a lot of new discussions. Um, and I think that it's important to admit that many of the people who are handling the issue um, are still trying to figure things out as they go along. Mm -hmm. And it's a very fluid situation. And as things change, you know, perspectives might change, recommendations and, uh, might change as well. Right. And I think that's the, um, that's the part of it that's sort of scary about it is that it is an ever-changing uh, process and I think what you spoke to is the fact that it sort of hit much closer to home than we would have realized and um, and it and it just happened so quickly uh, that I think it was sort of beyond uh, you know belief uh, for many of us including myself um, Dr. Austin what about yourself uh, well I, you know so so I'm an ER physician at the University of Chicago Juan, and first I'll say uh, you know May Allah bless you and all those people gathered here, and may Allah protect everybody at home. Um, so for me, the first relationship is always as, as a physician, right? So, mm -hmm. so I fully expect, uh, you know, our department has been thinking about how we um, take care of patients that will be coming with questions of having coronavirus, or actually who will have coronavirus, right? Mm -hmm. um, how is our hospital going to be ready for the influx of patients? Um, we've had a lot of policies, for example, in my hospital around canceling of classes, right? Mm -hmm. So there's classes yeah. I teach. Uh, class of classes, doing online things. So, so the first relationship to this was in a, in a professional capacity as how we're going to deal with it as a physician, then how is my university dealing with it. And just to be honest with you, you know, kids have spring break, I was supposed to go to Malaysia, mm -hmm. you know, okay. and, and, yeah. and there was this conversation and I was going to bring my parents uh, and my in-laws and the conversation was, well, you know, should we go, shouldn't we go, what do you think? And every day for the last 30 days I'm looking at WHO reports, where is it, can we go, can we not go? And if you're in a leadership authority or you're someone who knows something about medicine, I can imagine many physicians here, everybody in your circle is texting you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what or should I tell my kids? Should I go to school? Or should they not right go to school? <laughs> so, so for me, it was the same thing that almost every physician, I'm sure, was watching has had that conversation that all of a sudden you have to develop your expertise in what this is or isn't, even if it's not your field. Mm -hmm. And then also just today, I mean, there's this question, and alhamdulillah, we're as constant a community. You know, I, people in Tonomi say, I joke, Chicago Sharif. <laughs> more Muftis in Chicago than many Muslim countries in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, but then everybody, Muftis are asking if there's a medical issue, how do we relate this in a legal sense mm -hmm. or religious sense? So I'll just stop there. But I think that, that for me uh, in this conversation, it's, yeah, hit home. Right? Mm -hmm. Kids going to go to school, do I go on vacation? What's the protocol at the hospital? Yeah. Um, and then how is our community dealing with it? I right. think that all of us are enmeshed in these different conversations. Mm -hmm. And I congratulate you for having a conversation amongst us to think about that because yeah. it's not just as one part of our life, but all parts of our life are being right, affected right. by a potentiality which became an actuality. Yeah, oftentimes as, as, as community providers uh, and leaders, we tend to deal with issues that we maybe never have seen a lot or haven't hit us. Mm -hmm. And um, especially as a psychologist, I'm sure you could relate this idea of empathizing with a lot of things that we may never experience in our lives, inshallah, Allah protect us all. But uh, but then you have this scenario where you have to care for others um, around this issue while you're having to deal with it firsthand on your own as well. So I think that's sort of what you're, you're speaking to uh, while taking care of others, taking care of self. Um, 
Dr. Summer, what about what about yourself? How was uh, uh, what was this experience like for you? Alhamdulillah. I mean, at first, I think a lot of it was very cognitive, like all the information, listening to, you know, what people are sharing through media, contacting me on the WhatsApp groups, information about it. But I think emotionally, I, I felt it. I think the other day I was at a, at a major bulk grocery store, <laughs> and I, I was just it was just another day. I was going there to grocery shop, and I think seeing everybody with like panicked faces, you know, mm -hmm. looking and talking about yeah. the things that they want to buy that they can't find and just the empty aisles. I started to emotionally feel like my heart rate started to go up. I started to feel a little bit anxious. And then mm -hmm. I pause and realize like, even if I'm a mental health professional mm -hmm. and I'm aware of the impact, I'm not immune to it. Right. right. So I kind of took a moment to just pause and rebalance myself and align myself, you know, spiritually, how do I think about this? Mm -hmm. Emotionally, how do I think about this? And just kind of ground myself. What are what are the basic small practical steps yeah. I'm taking? But I think that moment I started to feel like that a little bit of the anxiety that mm -hmm. people around me were experiencing. Yeah, and it sounds like you were also trying to stock up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Find the <thorax. laughs> You know, you know, one of the interesting experiences was that last night because um, there were a lot of physicians that mobilized as well, and there was a lot of communication amongst the physicians as mm -hmm. to what recommendations that they would make that they would make independent of what the messages and the institutions uh, uh, and larger umbrella organizations were deciding um, and 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 they were commenting on how you know we need to be patient and a couple of them expressed their appreciation for like the ulama on the 29th of Shaba. <laughs> and like it's like oh is this what you experience every Ramadan <laughs> it's, it's exactly this mass communication you open your your phone and there's 150 messages waiting for you to read and discussions taking place and people waiting for decisions and um, it's a very interesting kind of yeah. experience but what I thought was really unique this time uh, or uh, on this, for this uh, particular uh, incident um, was that there was a lot of collaborative um, you know work and there was a lot of discussion taking place across speci uh, specializations and I think that that will continue and it's, I think it's a very healthy yeah. it's a positive in, the, in a bad situation right yeah Alhamdulillah. I mean, in fact, the fact that the, the, the idea that we we've all sort of gathered here um, as interdisciplinary, um, you know, across different uh, areas and specialties to address a common problem that's afflicting all of us, and in particular, our, right, trying to respond to the needs of our community. Yeah. Um, inshallah, the part of the khayr is that it's bringing people together in in tough times to kind of try to you know uh, tackle a, 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 a tough issue. If not uh, physically. Uh, perhaps intellectually, right? Yeah. <laughs> Social distancing. Right, effects, right. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, as academics, we have a, a tendency to sort of, uh, uh, you know, intellectualize <laughs> our, uh, you know, and, and to kind of stay away from the, uh, the emotional uh, part of uh, part of what might be going on here to, to it's sort of an avoidant uh, coping mechanism. Um, Dr. Asim, can we start with um, just some basic information sure. about what is this? I think a lot of, there's a lot of information going on out there. And, you know, we've all become kind of social media junkies. If we weren't before, <laughs> then we've become that way, um, especially as we're, you know, getting stuck at home and not leaving. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, trying to connect with the outside world, trying to get as much information about this uh, as possible. And um, and so that's leading to, you know, sleeplessness, like <laughs> confusion, uh, information overload, feeling overwhelmed. Um, can you speak to? Um, can can we just get a brief kind of synopsis and overview of sure, what sure. is this thing? <clears throat> so I can give an overview um, of what this is. I'll say with a caveat, you know, I'm not an ID specialist. I'm an emergency medicine physician, and my information is also filtered through the channels people have as physicians. So there's a general fund of knowledge you have, but there's a particularities, and so I don't want to speak to areas that I'm not expert in. And I'll also say, actually, I'll, I'll, I'm going to give some uh, the props, I guess, because uh, people sometimes don't trust our medical authorities, but I think Dr. Anthony Fauci has done an amazing job. Like, just to be honest with you, and communicating with the public, raising issues with the, with the policymakers, um, and those sorts of individuals, I think, should be prized, whether they're from our community or not, who are able to communicate in a very simple way to the population. So with that, I'll say, so I think you should follow his, 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 his YouTube messages or whatever from the can, CDC. Can you repeat his name? Anthony Fauci, basically okay. director of the National Institute of Allergy uh, in, in, in D.C. 
So coronavirus, right, is a part of a family, there's a, there's a vi family of viruses, coronaviruses, right, that are part of the same family which, which we get the common cold from. The challenge here for us is that this is a virus that is different from ones we've seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, there's questions, and we're not going to get the theology of mutation and evolution here, but mm -hmm. it's a question of how it arose, where it came from. Mm -hmm. um, WHO sort of thought that maybe this came from animals, mm -hmm. right? Like the swine flu did. Uh, they mutated and then started infecting human beings. Mm -hmm. Things are still f not fully known, right? This is data that's new. But for us, the problem is that it became something that globalized, right? So mm -hmm. you heard uh, that it's now a pandemic. And right. what that really means yeah. is the fact that there's increased incidence of community transmission, right? So while this started in, you know, in Wuhan, Hubei province, mm -hmm. that that was people related to that were getting infected. Mm -hmm. Now we have community transmission in the United States where there's no connection to that mm -hmm. initial area, right? Right. right? And if you have that in one area, fine. We've had it globally in many different countries, then the WHO calls it a pandemic. And that's what we're having. So in yeah. Chicago, right, we're concerned. But by community, uh, community transmission, you mean to say that um, it's not being imported over anymore, but the fact that it's entered the community by members giving it to other members. Two, the two different things. Is right? that what you mean by it? So, so two things. One is, yeah, it's not imported from somewhere else. The other is we don't know. We can't connect the dots to that locale. Okay. But Got people it. have obtained it. Got right? it. Got it. Um, so you could say, yeah, if you quarant, so this is why the idea, okay, well, let's not have any travel, we have a travel ban from China, which mm -hmm. the United States did early on, right? Uh, because, okay, maybe all the cases were there, if we could stop people from coming from there here, mm -hmm. but now you're having community transmission, meaning we can't actually trace how they got it. Mm -hmm. So Chicago has had, in my own hospital, we had the first case today, University of Chicago, wow. um, and I think there was like 29 or 30, maybe now it's 50 cases in greater, greater Illinois right. that we're worried about. In the United yeah, States- up from 11, right? right? Yeah, yeah. A couple of days ago. All right, so I'll talk about the growth curve in a second, uh, but there's like 16, over 600 cases in the United States. There's been, I think, uh, over 40, 50 deaths. Globally, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people and thousands of deaths. Mm -hmm. so, so this is, I think, the context becomes, right, pandemic, it's a, uh, interestingly enough, it's a, it's a cold type illness, but we are calling it influenza-like illness. So it's not the flu, mm -hmm. but for most people, they understand what the flu is, right? You have mm -hmm. a fever, cough, respiratory mm -hmm. symptoms, muscle aches. So for the common population, you think about it that way, it's a flu-like illness, mm -hmm. although it's different from the flu, right. um, and has a different mortality rate, and all these sorts of things. So I'll just say that, that this is something that you will imagine to be like the flu with fever, cough, mm -hmm. symptoms, rain nose, um, and those are the symptoms. And the, the idea of the curve, since you brought this up, um, I'm sure all the Saudi media, Saudi media who are watching this know about flattening the curve and all this other mm -hmm. stuff, but that all these measures, which some might say are draconian or overkill, Mm. are because we are now at the exponential part of the curve, right? I see. That there was one case, I think the first case in the United States in January. Okay. First case in China was in December. Yeah. China, right? Then it became 50,000, 100,000. So in the United States, we had one case in January. We're now in March, and over the last two, three weeks, it's been 150, you know, 70, 100. Every day you get more cases. So we're now at the part of the curve that's going to go up very quickly. Okay. And this is the how to, long? That's the question. I think how long? Is, how long? How long is going to last? But the the fact is, and Dr. Fauci said this right, that the fact is that there are going to be hundreds of thousands of people who are going to get this disease, and the capacity of the United States. I want to stop for a second, but the, we have to recognize that we are not like other countries, and that we're not testing everybody. Mm -hmm. So the true prevalence of the disease in the community, we don't know. Mm. But we do know that we have community transmission. People can't trace back to China. I see. Therefore, it's here. It's already here. Containment won't work. we got to figure out how to manage and mitigate what's here. I see. So that, um, as everybody's saying, flatten the curve so that we don't have a huge peak mm. uh, of deaths that overtask the capacity of healthcare systems to deal with it. Mm. I can talk more about that, but I just think for a general fund of knowledge, we should recognize that it's a flu-like illness it has similar symptomatology. It's different in its mortality rate. Mm -hmm. um, but the people who are at risk from flu, you think about, they are similarly at risk for this. And the last thing I'll say is that two things, right? We should recognize that there is no vaccine. Mm. So part of the reason why flu, although it is uh, harmful, people die every year, there is a vaccine for the flu that at least, for some people, we think about herd immunity. Some people think about reduces the illness length. There is no such thing. And... It's not like a pneumonia that you get bacterial pneumonia that I can treat you with antibiotics. Right. We have no treatment. 
Mm. So the only thing that's left are public health measures, mm. right? And to be honest, we actually don't have a natural history yet. That's what mm. we're saying. It's like Italy or China, because this is just five, not even five months old. Right. right. So are we saying there's no vaccine yet, or there's no possibility? Because my impression is that there is the possibility of a vaccine. Yes. Yeah, so I think those are questions that specialists in that area who develop my R&D specialists would say. The communication from our healthcare leaders in the United States is that uh, if at best we're thinking months, right, maybe years before we do that, uh, I can tell you as a researcher, right, develop, taking a drug to market is years. Vaccine development is not easy. We're talking about vaccine for malaria for decades. Perhaps this is different, but we shouldn't hope for a quick fix, right, which is why all these things have happened all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. That, oh, yeah, we're going to have a vaccine tomorrow. And even if you had one, mm -hmm. can you get it out to everybody? Right, right. Right? Yeah. Um, so I don't think we should yeah. count on that at any point. I think part of what you're 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 saying is that, um, you know, there's this exponential growth and this huge question mark because we don't know who's carrying it, who's not. It's out there, and we're not testing enough. So uh, for all intents and purposes, it sounds to me like we have an underreporting right uh, currently or underdiagnosis and confirmation of these cases, um, which. Cr creates, I think, contributes to the alarm. No vaccine, we don't, we're on the exponential growth. We don't know how long that's going to last for. Um, some people are going as far as I've heard saying that, you know, everybody's eventually gonna get it at some right. point because right. of the mass transmission. And there's no symptoms before, you know, the first five days or so up to five days or even 14 days, you might be symptom free but you're a carrier and you're passing it on. So, so, so let, me, yeah, let me speak to two things about that. One, that's also the really interesting thing here is that you're infectious before you have symptoms, so you might not know, which, which as you said, that's just, that's just how the disease works. That's how the virus works. So that's different from other viruses, right? Mm -hmm. So it could be here. Even if you had the test, you might not want to go get the test because you didn't think I was sick, right? Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, this is subhanAllah, it's so amazing how every part of this is so interestingly different uh, that leads to all these things that we haven't seen before in our lives. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, right, other diseases, you screen people with certain symptomatology. Here, we don't even know, and then if you don't know, you're not going to go get the, if you yeah. get the test. Right. Right. And right. the opposite end, you can get ill mm -hmm. and, so, and be fine and feel, hey, I have no fever in 24 hours, I'm not coughing, mm -hmm. but you still might be shedding the virus. Yeah, yeah. Right? So we were talking about 14 day quarantines, like they're telling us in the healthcare environment. If you travel anywhere, Make sure you have coverage for this is why I said coverage for your shifts for the next two weeks. Why? Because you don't want to come back because we can't even tell you if you're not infectious, right? I see. Um, the reason that seems so odd is because yeah, you could be feeling well, not mm -hmm. have a fever, but if you were sick with this disease, you still could be shedding it, mm -hmm. right? And people won't know. Right. So the two week period after that two week period. So so Alvin Fauci said this right. So interestingly, he said. Well, the only way we can certify that you don't have disease is two negative tests in 24 hours, right? Because we would actually have to say, okay, you're not infectious by a specific test, yes. right? I see. Right? You have to have something to compare it against. N no, no, no. Okay. Because we need to know the proof of that. I see. Because this is what I'm saying. This is a new disease. We can assume that you're not infectious. But to say that you don't have that virus in your body, we would have to do a biological test to test that, right? I see. And two of them, because one might be, right? Yeah. Right? Might be okay, might not. There's a, every test is 99 point whatever percent. So this is what I'm saying. This is such an interesting, from a, I shouldn't say interesting, um, yeah. for intellectually, right? Intellectually, it's interesting. But I think the characteristics of disease make all these people are telling you, right, that, that you should worry, you should worry. But I think there's a fine line between worrying and being alarmist. Mm -hmm. And I think you guys can speak to that, right? There's yeah. worrying, being credible risk, thinking about these things, being careful, right. to then being in panic. Mm -hmm. Serving anxiety, being alarmist, yeah. and and that only, f you know, psychologically and spiritually is right. I think harmful yeah. across the community. Yeah, I, could you speak to the psych psychology of this? I think that you're right. you're sort of alluding to this uh, a contagion of fear, and it sounds to me like it's a, from what Dr. Asim is saying is that it is a very real uh, fear and threat. Um, it's it's not imagined. Um, there's so much we don't know about it, mm -hmm. and uh, and we're not finding enough reassurance even in our healthcare professionals mm -hmm. because they're caught off guard by it because of all of the features that you described that there's so much, uh, so much. Uh, this is so much of an anomaly uh, from what we've seen before mm -hmm. um, that there is reason to be scared and there isn't much reassurance that we're finding, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, 
you know, we kind of feel like we're out of control here. And, uh, and so what do we do? We, you know, go to, go, go to like grocery stores and, <laughs> and stock up. Can, can you help um, kind of speak to this, um, this, this fear aspect of it? Absolutely. And I think there's a lot of focus on how contagious the, the virus is. I think a lot of people aren't paying attention to how contagious the emotions and the anxiety and the fear is. Like I mentioned, when I went to the store and I started to see people, mm -hmm. I started to feel that fear that they were feeling. Um, so uh, fear contagion is actually a social psychology phenomenon where uh, an emotion is spread between, from an individual or group of people mm -hmm. to a larger community. And we're seeing it worldwide spreading, of course, with social media and people communicating and being touched. Um, I think what's fueling this fear also is the uncertainty and the unpredictability mm -hmm. of this virus. Mm -hmm. um, and when people are experiencing fear at high levels or are overwhelmed, their rational thinking goes down. Mm -hmm. So they start to do mm -hmm. behaviors or actions okay. that might not be rational mm -hmm. in terms of protecting them from the virus. Yeah. Like going back, I know there's like, we're labeling the toilet paper phenomenon right, right. now. Like people <laughs> purchasing. Or hand sanitizers. Exactly. <laughs> and I think, I'm sure you'll speak to this, but we're not against of being prepared and it's normal to have this level of stress when there's when we, when we feel unsafe or insecure mm -hmm. we our body is wired to experience that fear mm -hmm. and feel the insecurity in order to protect ourselves mm -hmm. uh, but however when we become alarmist and the fear is exaggerated uh, or leading us to do behaviors that are not rationally helpful mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of protecting us that becomes a problem yeah um, yeah and there's that law of diminishing return, right? Mm -hmm. That sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, your anxiety is healthy to a certain extent where it allows you to become prepared. But then once it, you know, goes above that threshold, um, you have diminishing return. So right. you start to, um, you know, have anxiety that isn't actually beneficial for you anymore. And it's having actually, and, and this is this piece, I don't, you know, where also our immune systems can uh, become weakened by, you know, over uh, becoming uh, overly stressed Absolutely. and having this chronic long-term yeah. uh, kind of stress as well. Uh, uh, can I, so I think, yeah, yeah the sleep patterns, right? Uh, people who are already have predilection towards sort of anxiety become even more anxious, right? And as we mentioned, what we call an ER, we can say mis mis mass hysteria, these sorts of things. But the other thing I think that's problematic, perhaps this is uh, an opening for you, Malala Malal, but we then become in this perceived sense of fictitious control, right? So I'm going to do behaviors, I'm going to scrub everything down, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and then God forbid, one of our relations, something happens in our circle, that myth of control shatters, mm -hmm. and we have nothing to fall back upon, yeah. right? Like yeah. There's a, another end to that, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, and so I think starting off with this notion that I can control, I mean, we have to be measured in our notions, right. but if you become hyper that I'm going to control everything and I can manage it, you're not preparing yourself at all for anything that might happen that's problematic, and then yeah. you're shattered. Right? Yeah, and, and that speaks directly to the spiritual health question. That I think if you look at, I mean, it's, it, I think it's critical that Muslims approach the issue of any disease of this nature differently, uh, based upon our theology. Right? And mm -hmm. then, and that theology does revolve around this question of ikhtiyar, right? Mm -hmm. What we have choice, um, and 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 admitting um, those things that are beyond our control. And this is definitely something that I think that the experts are telling us is that we have to be able to, to release some of that need for control mm -hmm. and to be able to acknowledge that a lot of what's going to take place in the next few weeks, next few months is going to be beyond our control. Um, and I think it's really interesting if you look at how as early as the time of the companions, you know, um, that was a question, right? Like how much control do we have? And the, the Qadr issue or the, mm -hmm. the destiny issue mm -hmm. came up in addressing probably one of the, the what we know as the, the first plague, mm. or, or ta'un, um, or, or ta'un, I think, he, like Ibn Hajar Asqalani more defines it as just anything, any widely spread disease, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that took place in Amawas, uh, in the, called ta'un Amawas, um, in which 25,000 people died. Oh, oh wow. Well. And, oh. and it's really interesting about that ta'un is that... Um, this was in the Khilafah? This, uh, this was in, according to some, it was the 17th year or 18th year of Hijri. Okay. Right. Uh, according to the, the historians, they differ in, as exactly what year it took place. But I mean, uh, senior companions died in that, um, mm. including Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah, mm. Mu'ad ibn Jabal, Shurah ibn Hassana, yeah, Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan, and others. And, and so there were there were like senior companions, even not just companions, but, but authorities and leaders. Abu Ubaid was the same 
leader who was appointed by Umar ibn Khattab who questioned Umar ibn Khattab's hesitancy to come to right. the area of the Ta'un and said, you know, Amir al-Mu'mineen, afirar min qadaillah, are you, are you trying to escape the, um, the mm. dest- predestiny, right? Mm. What's destined, uh, what Allah has destined for you. That's very interesting. And then, and then Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu reacted and, and can be, you know, in review that this is coming from you, Abu Ubaidah. Mm. Right. If it only someone else had said this, he said, "Afiru min qadrillahi ila qadrillahi." That's wow. That I, I, I'm, I'm running from the qadr of Allah towards the qadr of Allah, mm. and that essentially this decision to allow for a sort of a quarantine and to avoid entering the area in which that uh, that ta'un exists is also sort of within our control. And so mm. he knew, he recognized after, of course, there was consultation that took mm-hmm. place, and that's an interesting thing also to see is that. Abu al-Khattab did not make that decision to enter into Sham, the area of Sham in which the, the disease had spread, until he had consulted with um, senior companions who were alive and who were going to accompany him. And their uh, fear, right, that yes, if this is contagious enough that it gets to these companions who are accompanying you, we will lose our leadership, mm-hmm. right? right? And, mm-hmm. and then uh, he, you know, he had to ask the question as to whether or not this is within our control or not. And the answer that you know he came, or the conclusion that he came to, is that this is within our control, mm. and we have to take action, and err on the side of precaution. And certainly, it is possible that Umar bin Khattab could have gone and avoided the disease, right? Mm. As a physician today, actually, my father was telling me that, very interestingly enough, trying to give people to avoid that alarmist sort of attitude, he was saying that, you know, that there's no definitive um, relationship uh, between disease and death. You know, mm. you <laughs> but not everybody who's who dies is dies of disease, and there's no, and everybody who gets disease is mm. going to die. Right, right. So you know, I mean, like you do need to kind of balance this idea that we're thinking that every everyone who is afflicted with a disease is going to die. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it's interesting that Abu Ubaid that passes away from that, mm. right? Mm-hmm. But Ibn Hajar al Asqalani actually in in uh, in the thirty three or so texts that deal with Ta'un. Um, that I'm aware of, he titled his Badrun Ma'un fi Fadl al I mean, and, and so he, in, in sort of the, the, he calls it the, uh, the, he titles it the virtues or the excellence of, of Ta'un, right? And sort of taking like the, the positive spin so on, re- on, so on, re- on re- it. reframing it, exactly. Yeah, so he's, yeah. he's saying that this is obviously an affliction. And the way he describes it, I mean, the panic and alarm is sort of contained within the definition of Ta'un. Mm. That it's not just widespread a disease, um, and it's not mm. an abnormal disease. Yeah, it's, it's not just widespread, but also something that you don't see uh, uh, customarily or conventionally in the community. Mm. But he also says that it's something that causes huzun and ham. Yeah. He talks about the psychological effect of it. Mm. So, uh, but then at the same time, he's he's talking about its relative mm. like virtues to some degree and how the people are, are, are to, to deal with that. Yeah. And I think that that's that's really key because if you look at throughout history, and I haven't studied the entire you know, history of how Muslims dealt with Ta'un. Mm-hmm. But um, it seems like there there was an a, a attempt to check that alarm mm-hmm. and to recognize that if this is beyond our control, do whatever you can. And then leave, especially in this case, where we don't even know who really is Marid. Yeah. It's very hard to make decisions. When decisions are made, just, you know, appreciate that right. there's a lot of amb- ambiguity there. Mm-hmm. Can I just say something else? I'll, I'll, but so, so it's interesting, I'll say, and I don't think I'm just medically, but, but, you know, when I came home, my, my kid's school was closed now for next week. And, and uh, one of my daughters, right, uh, was saying that, you know, so, so this idea of okay, you know, debrief what's going on. The kids obviously know something's going on. School's yeah. canceled next week. They're all worried about coronavirus. And I don't remember exactly what she said, but the idea was, okay, well, you know, they're putting people on ventilators. People are going to die, right? And I was like, no, people aren't going to die. And she heard this, this? I, my daughter said this, she's like, tenant. And my, she threw a look to my wife, like, I'm just trying to make her feel okay. Like, little kids, don't worry about it, right? No, no, no. No, 99 out of 100 people aren't going to die, right? Mm-hmm. Unless it's be real. Um, there are people who are higher risk of death. Mm-hmm. But this isn't like, you know, when we, I mean, because media has this sort of way, like Ebola, mm-hmm. people are bleeding out. Right? Yeah. So what is going on in the mind of kids in their house, mm-hmm. right? Am I not going to see my grandfather tomorrow? I'm not yeah. going to see my mother tomorrow. Because once we get the disease in Chicago, they're all going to die. I mean, right, right. this is not a, 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 a cogent, comprehensive, rationally thought about response, mm-hmm. right? It affects us, but I think we should also be, what's the facts? What's yeah. the evidence here, right? This is not uh, like mm-hmm. that. Most people who get it right, are not going to 
inshallah, uh, suffer mortality. Mm-hmm. Um, you might get sick. You might be hurtful, right? But and I'm not saying you go and seek that. I'm just sort of yeah. saying you have to be measured in how you communicate about this, even within your own family, because mm-hmm. you don't know. I mean, I didn't know my kids were thinking they're going to die yeah. tomorrow, yeah. right? Absolutely. But they could be thinking that. Yeah. Right? Right. Definitely. Right? And I think when we talk about even how to talk to kids about this, like there's a saying that kids listen with their eyes. So whatever you tell them, but they're going to watch, hmm. look at your reaction when you're talking to people. And I think when there's ambiguity, people pull into what information they have, like the mm-hmm. images from the media, you know, when it's the apocalypse, people are running yeah. the stores and grabbing right, everything. Right, right. And people are just like having a knee jerk reaction to act in these irrational ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it's, it, it sounds to me like there, there's almost like with, with the kids, they can see actually what's mm-hmm. underneath our behaviors, mm-hmm. right? And and and, yeah. and ultimately what we're, you know, all frantic about mm-hmm. is that we're coming face to face with death, right? Mm-hmm. The idea of death, at mm-hmm. least. Mm-hmm. There's a sort sort of some um, you know, uh, some some psychological theories about uh, how the uh, western countries tend to kind of uh, try to shun the elderly, right? Um, because they represent death. And so we don't want to see that and to be, have, have to be reminded of that. So we kind of put them away. We don't put them on media or shows or billboards or whatnot and, uh, and put them in nursing homes and whatnot. And you can, that's another con- you know, topic, uh, you know, uh, not, not saying that. Don't visit you know, nursing don't... homes during this crisis, please. Uh, as a fellow professional, please don't go there. They're high risk. <laughs> Call them. FaceTime. Don't go. Yeah. Um, but there's that sense of the the, the, the the children are almost like seeing that mm-hmm. that that uh, and they're and and and, the, and they're asking directly about it, whereas it may sort of rest in our subconscious and and our, our attempt to try to kind of you know uh, gain control. Um, Moblo, could you speak to you were speaking about um, this issue? I, I kind of want because it's the idea that's growing around a lot. This notion of you know, control versus letting go of control, right? Like, you, if you go to one side, uh, then you're trying to exert too much control, and, and you said psychologically that's not going to be healthy, right? Um, and then it also has physiological consequences, right? Um, and then, but then you can go to the other extreme, and um, people will say, you know, uh, this is some sort of, um, you know, uh, CIA conspiracy, or, <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, I don't know, Chinese people eating all sorts of animals that are attempting to, you know, somebody's trying to destroy the economy. Or it's, there's all sorts of notions, and I'm not going to let this bother me. I'm going to have tawakkul. You know, Sahaba picked up a bottle and, 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 and made a dua and, like, drank poison. poison. You know? so, <laughs> right, right. so, you know, I'm going to Jummah, right? <laughs> and, um, and, and I had, an, uh, you know, so, uh, I've had elderly uh, clients who have, come in, you know, without hesitation, even though I thought they might prefer web therapy or something like that. Mm-hmm. And they're like, I'm going to Juma, you know? <laughs> and so, um, and that, and that's, I think that's okay for them to kind of have that, that, that notion. And of course it's a personal decision for everybody, but at the same time, um, you know, how do we understand what that fine line is? And, and, and I think, you know, we can look at very extremes, but then the, 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 the more subtle extremes is, I think, where the problem lies. And that's where I think we get into a lot of dispute about are we erring yeah. too much on caution? And then are we, you know, subjecting ourselves to too much risk? Yeah. I think the word that you use, fine line, I mean, that's key. There is no fine line, right? And if someone is choosing to, I think and, and there are certain extremes that are clear extremes, right? Denying the contagious nature of diseases. Is a misinterpretation, or it's a weak interpretation of a hadith, la adu wa la tiyata fil Islam, mm-hmm. um, and the vast majority of investigative scholars of hadith have, have, have clarified that this does not deny uh, this hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not denying that these diseases are infectious mm-hmm. and contagious, and that um, you know we shouldn't um, use preventative measures to prevent the further contagion, and you should not go into a, a scenario where you are. Going to so potentially, yeah, you're susceptible, especially if your immune system is compromised, mm-hmm. um, or if you are yourself potentially showing symptoms. Going into that situation is actually responsible, and you're, you could be ethically responsible for that. However, if it's and because it's not a fine line situation, a lot of people are, are you know healthy, 
they may be infected, mm -hmm. but they, they appear to be healthy and they feel like the Wakud is allowing them to just kind of function as normal. Right. Um, you know, it's hard to say that that is also unethical, right? Because mm -hmm. they don't appear to be sick. They don't appear to be creating, mm -hmm. uh, spreading sickness. Um, and until you can make that determination that someone is, this is how like sort of the Fuqaha and I are discussing this is that how do we, de how do we prevent people from coming to ga gatherings which are part of sort of the spiritual element of, of health, which mm. does also impact physiological health and, and, and mental health. Mm. How are we telling people they, they cannot come to those congregations without a clear demarcation of who is sick and who is not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we are testing and we can say, okay, someone is sick, then it's, it's, it's a simple answer. And if it's not, then, you know, we have to, we have to kind of realize that there, it's, a gray, it's a gray area situation. Mm. There's no fine line. And I think, I think that medically, I think that, that I'll say that we have to recognize the truth that this is a very changing situation hour by hour, day by day. But as I said, there was, we know that there's some community cases in, in, in Chicago land, mm -hmm. right? And we expect with the exponential growth that next week there'll be more, mm -hmm. and the week after there'll be more, all right? And this might last several months, right? Um, I mean, Allah make it last a short, uh, shorter time. But even our efforts, right? Just, you know, I, I want us to understand, by social isolating, because the United States is a vast country, you might have pockets where there's still community transmission. They travel, right? And I mean, right, you can have this prolonged notion of what's happening. So when we make decisions today, we're actually thinking, forecasting things are going to happen four or five, six, ten weeks from now. Um, but, but I, you know, I'll say this, now, I'm not going to pick on the ulama. I mean, I think that the po point here is that your point is valid, that we have to recognize there are certain things that people need to function normally. It's a normal response, right? And unfortunately, we don't have a great marker or test to say who's not or who isn't sick. But our response shouldn't immediately be that shut up because then everything we have to shut down, right? Mm -hmm. right? Everything needs to be shut down. And we stay in our homes. That's what China did, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, United States won't tolerate that probably. Uh, but that's what they did because they said there's no way to tell. We want everything shut down totally. That's mm -hmm. what Italy is trying to do now. And it might come to that. But I'm just sort of saying then, then there's no question about religious service or anything else because this is now right? A, yeah. a, 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 everybody has to quarantine totally. And that's where the collaboration was key. We had a conversation last night, and one of the questions I think a lot of the scholars are having is that, okay, are we going to be able to, in two, three weeks, be able to test? Right. And once we test, then we can maybe basically change our protocols. So we're just taking precautionary measures now, shutting down congregational prayer. In two, three weeks, we'll have clarity. Mm -hmm. And so that's where then, you know, the physicians the experts are telling us, well, no, we're not testing. We're not going to be tested. Right? Or at, at that scale that you think that we're going to be in this. So, so today, I think, again, and I don't want to speak for what, I'll tell you my source, I've heard Dr. Fauci, right, and all these people saying, Trump, 5 million tests next week, right? How was the population of the United States? 230 million, yeah. right? Okay, say so you get 50 million tests, right? Everybody who thinks they need a test will get a test. I mean, this. my point, and even though our protocols, we're thinking about the hospital, well, we're going to, right now, self if you have an influenza-like illness, it takes 24 hours to get this test positive, it will tell you to self-quarantine. Mm -hmm. By that time, hopefully you haven't talked to 5,000 or 1,000 other people, right? But my point is this idea that we're going to do one-to-one -one testing and every case will be isolated, we're, that's gone. Mm -hmm. That is not happening uh, at any time soon, right? So, so to depend on something that we know, as I said, you can even have the test, but look at our population, mm -hmm. getting them out. Every hospital, we function right now at 93%, 94% capacity. Right. Right? So to say that now we're going to add on capacity to test everybody who wants to right. come through, we're drive, I mean, we're trying, yeah. but don't, exp are we not set up for this idea that we're going to be one-to-one -one correlation of everybody who's taking quarantine, those people only, and their relationships only, and then get the cultures back. This is not, I don't think, they might be able to get something happen, but that's not how we're preparing for uh, this notion. So, uh, so how do we, how does a common person prepare for that or process that information? Because what does that mean? For us, does that mean that we, um, it's almost like a losing battle or, or you, you know, what's the point in all of this precaution if um, we can't predict any, any of this, we can probably get sick anyways, it's so no, no, much, no, yeah. so, you know, mean, there isn't a whole lot of testing going along. Yeah, I don't mean to say it's just, I think that things are changing on the ground rapidly. The normal path that we understand and what they're saying is that exponential growth, next week more cases, the week after more cases, the week after more cases, and we hope that you know, in eight weeks time that we have less incidences, but if we, but, right, and, but we don't have a great sense. Like, so let's just take the example of China. China, the first case in December, China still has cases today. Yeah. There are new cases today, right? We're not at one billion population. Right. We're not Italy with 16 million. Mm -hmm. We're not, we have 330 million people, right? Uh, there's a lot of business travel. There's a lot of things happening everywhere else, right? There are a lot of factors. So I think 
that each country is like a, what we say in the HSR, natural experiment. Mm -hmm. It's a natural experiment of what's going to happen, what things work, what they don't work, and they're all trying. And so mm -hmm. we'll have to ride this out. So the religious ruling today, don't Joma say, okay, then I'm saying, yeah, prepare. What, are you, what is your marker to then say that you're going to do Dalawi, which is not fuddled? Or what's mm -hmm. your marker that you're going to open it up three weeks from now? Are you saying that we're not mm -hmm. doing Joma for the next three months? And then let's, let's, let's just be real that you're going to, we can maybe get some data, but you may, and here's the best thing, like I'll say, maybe Seattle has a lot of communication now, right? And maybe South, so we know we can say Joma based on fact, community prevalence is high, don't do it. Illinois had two cases, maybe, or whatever it was, right? I'm just saying that you're going to have to be consistent about what you do, and we better, if you're going to start doing this, then let's do it en masse, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then figure out what the, what the other strategies will be for what you just said. I mean, I can only imagine the 85-year-old who's never missed a Jum'ah, or not Jum'ah, Ramadan Tarawi, you're going to like lock the doors and say you can't come in? Right? I mean, I think we have to recognize that this is something that we're going to have to talk about, mm. and we'll be catching up with data, We'll be catching up recommendations by state authorities, and the ulama need to be savvy, right, about how we engage this through our own texts, um, and also not buy into mass fear and hysteria. Um, and I'm going to end here for one second. Sorry, I want so, so when we were speaking, and you know, Fahad's over there, Hafiz, so so. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "O ma alsawakum min musibat al-labi al-Allah, o ma o ma yu'min billah yahdi qalba, Allahu ala kulli shayin qadir." Right? So. So, the, like um, nothing that befalls you happens without the leave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the one, uh, the one who believes in Allah, Yahdi Qalba, he, now you can translate Yahdi, but guides, gives a core to, encapsulates, the, right? Uh, and then the verse is Allah, and Allah is powerful, all powerful, all, powerful, all, all things. Yeah. So, our texts are amazing to say the first response to these bala and all these things are to think about how it's happening. Mm -hmm. What's happening? The Qadr, right? So if you say, okay, no one you know, yes, exactly. pray, no one come to Juma, and that one person mm -hmm. that who is praying and his dua was accepted, and you have now mm -hmm. caused them distress, which you could reasonably, or no one's praying anything because we're saying, well, worried about social media and social isolation and mm -hmm. wiping down with Clorox. Yeah. Man, like Allah is in control. Who's yeah. he going to turn to? I'm not right. saying go and be egregious, but don't forget this. This is our deen. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, th I think if I can add, yeah. add a point to that, is that you know, I, we can appreciate that there's still ambiguity as to exactly what the origin of the disease is, but there's no ambiguity that it comes from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, right? right? And I think that answering that question is important because you know, like Shaykh Walidullah in his um, in the Hujjat al Badiqa, he discusses the idea that mental health and he connects mental health to the bohemian nature of human beings, and that if you feed that through what you eat and what you drink, you're only feeding sort of that that, that animalistic bestial element of the self, and that that creates then physical health question mm -hmm. problems and spreads disease and also mental health issues and things like that. And there's definitely going to be a link. Um, your spiritual health is going to be affected by what you eat and things like that. Um, but let's say that we don't we, we, we don't trace it to any sort of wet market in Wuhan, right? <laughs> and, and, and it's because of that. Which you know it's really odd that it it seemed like it, it could potentially be because of our hirs as a as a society, right? Small. Because that. You know, in the communist era, here is like covetousness and our greed because in the communist era they couldn't produce enough food and so people started wildlife uh, market uh, farming, <laughs> farming bears and strangers of animals that you know you wouldn't think to eat, but it was because more of the monetary motivation that the government had sanctioned that and they made that policy to legalize uh, wildlife farming. And then that then, you know, potentially now is being linked to the, the spread of uh, not just the COVID-19 but other diseases. I mean, you know, how does that link to potentially the question that people are asking? Is this part of all this Allah's wrath? Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Exactly. And 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 there may be a link, right? And there's and, and very likely to be a link. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, mm -hmm. to answer the question that I'm sure people a lot of people are asking is that is this an adab from Allah? Well, it depends on who is afflicted, right? And Hafiz ibn Hajar, I think he, when he says that these ta'uns are an adab upon the disbelieving nations or the previous nations, but it's a rahmah for ours. Mm -hmm. And that speaks to the idea that the way that you respond to it is the actual uh, answer to the question. Like, how do you respond to it? And our response needs to be spiritual, right? And so, congregational prayer, as Mufti Taqi Usmani actually uh, released uh, some, some advice about this recently, he said that, you know, we have to ask that question very uh, uh, carefully. Um, are we going to prevent people from accessing one of the means of preventing yeah. uh, this from spreading, which mm -hmm. is 
you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wrath is because of the fact that so much greed. Mm -hmm. And that's why Shaykh Amin's recommendations, I think, is also we should probably address to. Yeah. You know, one of them is giving sadaqah. You mm -hmm. know, sadaqah uh, You know, it, it uh, uh, extinguishes the wrath of, of Allah. You know, sacrificing an animal for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to avoid his wrath. You know, uh, um, reciting Surah Yasin every day. And, and in which the, is the opposite automatic reaction, exactly. which is go to the store and clean out and self-preservation and, 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 and no, you know, yeah, like, exactly. uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and it's almost opposite to the experience of uh, survival and, 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 and greed. This is going to the other extreme almost to regulate. Yeah, that. exactly. But you know, to, to speak positively, like subhanAllah, a lot, a lot of the awliya of our community and usually I, I think a lot of the hidden awliya, which are the women of the community, Without being told uh, the wazifa or the mashayikh, they already started the Salat al-Hajj every day, two rakahs. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of them thought it was, they're, they're, they're doing Salat al-Istikhara. Because <laughs> 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 it's what's bringing khayr into things. I mean, yeah, but, but they're like, they, they have a natural response that we're going to deal with this in the way that we can, which we have choice. We have ikhtiyar in this, right. we have choice. So they're dealing with it in this way. Now, it's interesting that in the Hanafi school, we don't consider congregational nafl prayers as, as sanctioned when it's with invited and you invite towards it but in other schools one of the responses to um and i, I saw this in books of the shafi school that one of the responses to widespread disease is congregational prayer mm -hmm. um, just like with istisqa when there's you know drought and and, yeah. and so i think the adopting these means is really it's really important that regardless of whether or not it's it's from animals or from bats or i think that we do need to ask this question that how long are we going to prevent people and or yeah. even just distract them from really right now what we should be get, turning people's attention to while we also appreciate the regulations mm -hmm. and then come up with long-term strategies and forecasts. I don't think anyone's thinking about Ramadan. In fact, the first person to think about Ramadan and, and to ask the question about if we're going to stop the Faraith now, no, no, what, no. are we going to be stopping the Nawafil in, in the no, Nafil no, prayers no. in Ramadan? Dr. Hassan was the first to bring that up. Because a lot of us are thinking just about tomorrow. Like, yeah. what, what happened this morning's Jummah? Right, know? right. Um, and I think that's a very important question to ask. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think these procedures, these policies that we, we put into place, we do need to look at it as a long-term so, strategy. So I was telling you, I don't want I don't want people online to think that we have some unitary, I just want to be caveat, like the ulama, as you said, they're collaborating, they're using the best evidence they have, they have the issue, they're deciding. I think that people should follow the authorities that, that what they're telling you to do. Um, and I don't think we were saying anything other than that. I just want to clarify. And I'll also say, what's, what's beautiful, and I shared this with you before we went online, a friend of mine was telling me that he did Jummah at home with his kids. He's never had this opportunity mm -hmm. to give a khutbah, you know, some, as she said, this hadith, and they talk, I mean, look at the spiritual benefit. The kids walk from school, they go to mm -hmm. school, they did a little Jummah in their house because they read somewhere they should do Jummah in their house. And so it was a time of coming together, thinking yeah. about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. I mean, these are benefits. Maybe if yeah. I just said that, it's okay. I don't know. But um, and right. again, there's so many blessings and amazing right. things that we can think about. We just have a moment to pause and not get up. Right? Yeah. How yeah. can I make this beneficial for us? Right. I, I wanted to actually go to that point with you. Uh, the the piece about um, you know, you guys are talking about sort of the communal aspect of of, of this mm -hmm. thing and regulation of Ramadan and you know, making sense of is this an adab or not and uh, punishment or whatnot, but um, you know, what do people do at, at, at home? Like if they're disconnected mm -hmm. from their spiritual coping resources, I mean, right. given that we work here at Little Center, a lot of our clients that are coming here are oftentimes looking for mm -hmm. some spiritual, ma making meaning out of spirituality. Mm -hmm. And if we're cutting a piece of that off for them, necessarily or not necessarily what Allah knows best, right? Then, then what yeah. what can be done and what's happening? Like how, can you speak to that the importance of personal spirituality to uh, to the mental health aspect of it and that social isolation that we're sort of creating. Absolutely. And as I was hearing you guys hearing hearing you both discuss, I was thinking of this quote that a professor used to say, like it's not either or, it's both and more. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not about going and going moving forward with life as it is, or isolating yourself completely. Mm -hmm. so how can you capture that important support, you know, spiritual support? And in Islam, we know that a lot of our spirituality is communal. There's a lot of communal. Yeah. And I was just thinking also, like, introverts probably have an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> introverts' advantage. But, um, but Sapala, I think, like, trying to, like the story that you shared was beautiful, like how they were able to transform into a strength and have this family gathering. And I know this is a little bit different, but I was thinking about women who sometimes during Ramadan when they don't fast, they, they sometimes feel like a negative feeling of I'm not participating. Mm -hmm. 
And to Pell, it's decreed from Allah. Yeah. And you're not supposed to fast or participate, but it challenges a woman to connect to Allah through different means. Mm-hmm. And I know this is a different experience for like men in the community yeah. being prevented from an ibadah that is not just an obligation, but there's a lot of joy and benefit, like the 85-year-old person who goes to Taraweeh. Just knowing that, you know, somebody once said, said are we calling to Islam or are we calling to Allah? Mm-hmm. You know, those so practices, I think, are an important part of Islam, but ultimately our goal is to be closer to Allah. Mm-hmm. Even in, is it an affliction? You know, is it a punishment or a blessing? Yeah. Is it bringing you closer to Allah or pushing you further away? And, you know, are you immersing more in the materialistic right. aspect of the world? But going back to how to cope with it, I think psychologically as well, um, I think one thing that I heard is action steps. What can you do? Yeah, yeah. So for children and for adults, being able to do something about a situation that's very uncertain and unpredictable brings a sense of security and comfort. Um, so, of course, modeling it as adults and also teaching it to children. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, basic, even making things very simple and structured and routine. Routine also brings comfort, you know, small and consistent action. Mm-hmm. So, for example, wash your hands, you know, uh, get good sleep, make sure you're eating, you know, try not to stress, like deep breathing. And what, what do you suggest about the social media aspect? Like if people are have to stay home with their families, right, right, absolutely. what should people be doing so that they can, you know, they often say, you know, like when you're enclosed in a room for a long period of time, you start to go crazy, you know, so... <laughs> People are going to fight over chargers. <laughs> no, but I think with social media and having time, I think one thing is to have one, when it comes to looking at information, having one reliable source of information. So uh, the Center of Disease and Control or World Health, Health Organization. So trying not to just openly search and have a specific time, let's say, preferably maybe not at night, maybe during the morning when you wake up, what's the updates? And just not go back so you're not right. stressing or feeding that anxiety. Uh, keeping busy at home. So one thing I actually noted as a recommendation talking to children because they're going to be home and have free time. Yeah. Uh, teaching them the value of time, mm. some time management, having them have basic goals during the day, you know, whether it's puzzles, some mm. activities at home just to keep them busy so they're not filled by just, you know, the fear of people around them or um, just wasting their time. Mm-hmm. And I think you had mentioned that a lot of children, or you might have mentioned, might have fear around like what's going to happen to the adults mm-hmm. in our community right. or the, our grandparents. Um, so I think something that helps is even with their teens tend to worry more about, you know, what's going to happen to other people. Younger children start mm-hmm. to worry, you know, about themselves. So even having them contact their grandparents or people who are important in their community through mm-hmm. Skype. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And the goal ultimately is just to have a normalcy in their life. Yeah. There's a lot that's changing and a lot of what's underlying the fear is, um, you know, is death. Mm-hmm. Am I going to die? but also is my life as I know it going to completely change. Right. I know my children are facing some of that in the sense of, you know, you know, unlike myself growing up, they really enjoy going to school. <laughs> so so they, 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 they were bummed out about the fact that they have to stay home. Um, but, um, you know, the idea that we can't go anywhere and like the weather is getting really nice for us in Chicago, right? <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and they're sort of, and, uh, and speaking of grandparents, I mean, you know, both sides, both grandmothers were going to come during spring break on different occasions mm-hmm. and, and they're out of town, right? They're in Canada. So they can't, they can't come and we have to sort of break the news to them that, and they're like, well, this is going to be a really boring like spring break. And how long is this going to go on for, right? <laughs> Uh, we can't do anything, right? Um, and then obviously we don't want them watching, like we don't want to get them on a screen the whole time right. just to kind of keep them busy. And then we're, we run out of it and we got to get online and start working from home mm-hmm. while we have these children around. I think it, it proves a very different mm-hmm. type of difficulty that we, uh, how do we sort of turn that challenge into a strength? And, and, and maybe if you can answer very briefly and we can have a few closing remarks just because we're coming to the, uh, end of our time, just some takeaways from each of you uh, that we can and we, that we can uh, close with. Right. So I think you said the weather is getting better. So it's okay to actually go out. It's just avoiding crowded places. So I think something important is to maintain routine, mm-hmm. uh, engage in activities. Parents might need to be adults, whether they have kids or not, need to be a little bit more creative about what can we do without putting ourselves in a place, you know, just risk, health, yeah. risk, risking our health. So going out for walks, going to parks, um, practice, you know, the basic practices of making sure you're washing your hands, not touching your face, but also it's okay to be out in nature. Um, so Pella, like there's a lot of studies that show being out in nature, help your brain self-regulate and calm mm-hmm. yourself down. 
Right. Um, so other than it being enjoyable, it can also help counter um, and fight the anxiety around the situation. Yeah. So I think I think I'll say there's two points. One, I think um, I would suggest that we recognize that we have a responsibility to the community, and we have to turn to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, right? So, so I, you know, some of our teachers is very interesting, and even Rasul also in a sense used to do this, but like they were worried that people around them are being affected because of their own failings. Mm. Right? You see stuff on social media, oh, you know, Chinese people eat these bad things, that's where you got it, right? But actually, it's maybe this adab right? is coming, not to you, because of failures that you have had as mm. you are a Muslim, and your responsibility is to make dua that Allah don't, we're not trial for other people that, you know, can I correct if I, this is the Muslim response, right? Um, a theological response. So look, this this is affecting everybody around us. What did I do? What can I? What did I make? Make a sick fall. Do something. Mm -hmm. and I think that's the action-oriented steps that we need to do to recognize. And I think that we oftentimes get caught up in what. But this is the direct mm -hmm. connection that you need to mend, mm -hmm. right? Um, for whatever reason, Allah is calling you back to Him. We must must do that. That's one. Mm -hmm. Secondly, and you know, a lot of and I'll say this um, to my own ilk, right? My my physician group, you know, physicians, mashallah, in the Muslim community. Went into doctoring, right? The high, a high price profession because we want to help people, educate them, take care of their health, right? Um, and sometimes we find people fail, like diabetic person to take their medicine, whatever. Um, I think we have to recognize in the end that there is a spectrum of people out there, and we're not going to be able to fix everything, mm -hmm. right? Meaning that our role here is to inform and engage, okay? But the ulama have a role to inform and engage. We have engage, engage with each other. But we should be able to find, every Muslim should be able to find themselves within that spectrum. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, unfortunately, what we end up doing is studying vitriol. This person's wrong, that person's right, this mm -hmm. person this. And mm -hmm. that, that musibah, right, that's fitna, yeah. is what we're calling that. So I think that, okay, you know, like, like, there's a lot of spectrum. People attend a lot of things. We should educate. But this, we cannot, at this time, afford to start throwing, you know, vitriol against other people mm -hmm. in the communities um, and saying that people shouldn't be doing this shit. I mean, yeah. you can recommend, but I think, and I, I'm saying that because physicians here, we really feel this is our role, this is our yeah. time. Right? I'm an ER doctor. Right. I, I was made for this, right? Yeah. Go to the ER, and <laughs> everybody's dying, and I'm here with my... Right. But listen, it's this is Allah SWT, so don't, don't over-inflate your sense of importance or your control of these things, and let people should... Let people find themselves within the deen of Allah SWT and the recommendations as best that they can. Yeah. Um, don't censure people for everything. And I'm not saying be careless, as mm -hmm. you were saying, but don't say, start, take your vote to tell everybody, everybody else is wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not going to be Yeah, it's, it's kind of forces you to have a humbling experience, right. it, it sounds like. And to speak to, I don't know if you wanted to address any of this in your closing remark, but the idea of uh, this, this diversity of approaches, right? Like yeah. we're getting... You're talking about physicians having different responses and, and recommendations and, and predictions because it's such a new thing. There isn't sort of a consensus or a clear linear <laughs> thing. I, I, I would joke with you guys now, now you guys are psychologists, right? I mean, because we deal with nonlinear problems a lot of times, right? That, that, that don't have a clear prediction or prognosis all the time. Um, but also um, that we're seeing in the religious communities, right? Like, like ulama, different masajid. Yeah. are taking different approaches. Yeah. Yeah. Some people are opting to close, some people are not. And certainly, I can hear some of the noise around it as to, uh, you know, these guys are uh, like risking the safety of people and then these guys don't have enough like Iman or, or right. you exactly. see what I'm saying? Right. And there's that stuff being tossed around. And so how do we sort of, you know, work within that environment to ensure that, you know, we're not becoming distracted in um, you know, missing the forest for the trees uh, right. in this whole entire experience. I think if we appreciate that that diversity exists and it should exist, and you should simply follow um, your local authorities, right? Because the, the principle is to follow the wadi who has sovereign authority. In the absence of that, your local institutions are, are, are serving that function. Um, we can appreciate that. And I, I almost predict that a lot of those messages will actually have reverse policies within a few weeks. Yeah. The ones that actually will have opened up their doors, will actually start closing them for reasons that would be justified, and the ones that were closing them eventually during a long time, they're going to start opening them up. And so I think a lot of that will become more clear over time. Um, and I think this is important to have that sort of positive attitude and appreciate that there are going to be differences of opinions, even within uh, colleagues, amongst colleagues on their issues. And there were a lot of diverse opinions that were expressed in certain bodies before they even came to um, a sort of a shared conclusion. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing is I think that, and that maybe just my, part of my closing remarks is that I think that um, just as we're planning the schedules of our children and ourselves during this time, 
know, there's there's always a spiritual benefit of chadwa, mm-hmm. um, sort of isolation, social isolation, and creating and maybe filling these gaps, these spiritual gaps where we're we're missing something. Using this as an opportunity to start very specific wallahi of litanies mm-hmm. and and spiritual exercises on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. This is a perfect time. Okay, can you recommend any? Answer? So the first thing would be that every morning Surya Yasin, mm-hmm. right? And then we can do this with the family. The children can do this as well, and this would be a great time because it'll associate a great difficulty. At home, yeah. Everyone's at home. They can recite Surya Yasin, Turaqa uh, Salat mm-hmm. Al um, and uh, this can be done in congregations with the children as well. Right? If mm-hmm. it needs to be done, although not with invitation in the Hanif school, um, so it wouldn't be that type of situation. So you could do that as a family activity. Um, the other thing is giving charity on a weekly basis and increasing it, right? Um, and having the children participate in that as well, just so they can see that, whether it be yeah. an online donation or, or right. some other form. Um, and the other thing was the uh, sacrificing of an animal, um, whether it's be by sending it abroad or, right. or something like that. The other thing is in, in terms of daily practices, also in terms of du'as. Um, Sheikh Mufti Muhammad Taqir Uthmani has been suggesting that um, uh, a lot of abundant recitation of La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al which highlights our own element, yeah. as Dr. Asim was talking about, that you know we're, we're acknowledging that there's a lot of oppression that we're, as Sheikh Amin calls yeah. it, we're like we're paving the way for to our science, the jan, the, mm. the jani path. Maybe this right. is part of that, and so we're doing thumb upon ourselves. Yeah, Allah, if that's the case, a lot of this la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al and then he also was recommending Allahumma um, rafa'an al bala wal waba. Allahumma rafa'an al bala wal waba. A more specific dua that oh, Allah lift from us in this community. Um, the affliction, al-bala, wal waba, this general uh, widespread illness. Um, and then he he also recommended that every, like, as a habit that we make sure that children when they leave the house or when we're leaving the house, we're leaving with that dua Allahumma uh, um, Every time you leave the house, right? Okay. And then also um, um, in the name of Allah, uh, um, that in His name nothing can harm. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, the, in the heavens and the earth, and he is all hearing and all knowing, mm-hmm. right? And he knows all of what's going on. And that, actually, that meaning is actually quite important to also mm-hmm. to impart in our kids. Um, and then he also recommended that we uh, keep this up that every after every salah ayat al kursi, which is a protection, right? And you know, I, I do this with my, my daughter, I try to remind her when she goes to school every day in the morning to do this, but after every salah now, mm-hmm. and if the, everyone is praying salah together at home. This is a good time to develop that habit. So, you know, maybe this is a positive that there's going to be a lot of like khalwa opportunities for yeah. 40 day jillas at home, you know? <laughs> You're going to have these spiritual experiences. And, and I think it's going to be a good precursor to Ramadan, inshallah. And no, no, one, no one really gets ill mm-hmm. and is affected. And those who are ill and are affected, they only get good out of it, inshallah. Uh, is it for, for those who may not have memorized those du'as, is there. Um, is, is there a place where they can access that or... Um, yeah, so what I can do is I will send those du'as to the uh, Khalil Center social media um, interns or whoever's in charge and then yeah. they can post it on the on, on Facebook and Twitter. And in fact, if any any of us had any sort of concrete mm-hmm. recommendations, perhaps that could be something we could put together as just um, takeaways from this uh, this discussion, you know, mm-hmm. if it's a one-pager. Uh, and we could send it out for individuals to benefit from, inshallah. Just a couple of closing remarks. I wanted to say thank you for reminding us. And I love the du'a, la ilaha illa an. Subhanak and yikuntu min al-dharmi, the du'a of Prophet Yunus. Because it, it saved him from out of the stomach of a whale. Mm-hmm. So a very unpredictable, uncertain situation <laughs> yeah. that you can't imagine will be out of. Right. Uh, but just kind of briefly wanted to say, like, so try to seek social support. It doesn't have to be in person, even through, you know, on the phone, through being mm-hmm. part of groups online. Uh, people who are struggling with mental health issues, anxiety or depression mm-hmm. can likely be affected more deeply. So try to seek support. There's a lot of online support and services. Yeah, um, and Khalil I, Center is, 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 is going online uh, in some of our offices, but awesome. even the ones that are staying open in particular Chicago and L.A., mm-hmm. we, um, you know, we have make available what therapy for those individuals who may get sick or, or who might be susceptible to sickness. Right. And I just wanted to note uh, the resource of the National Alliance of Mental Illness, uh, NAMI. So they have a warm line. You can contact them. This is for non- non-crisis situations if you need emotional support. Um, they also have contact information for 24 mm-hmm. seven uh, support if anybody needs any additional. I, I, I think that all of us, I would say that all of us, um, you know, are, 
parents probably were not going to be going shopping and stuff, so we were told, uh, right? Mm, so we should problem. make sure people can get food. I mean, yeah. get yeah. home delivery, Kroger, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. There are many people who don't have this ability, and maybe you go stock up, but make sure you're, you know, the, 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 the people around you right. can get food, you know? Yeah. yeah. Or, or feed each other in your, in your households, at least, too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, people are kind of close together for a long period of time, they would get on each other's nerves, so... <laughs> <laughs> time to start banking with the kids. <laughs> it's like yeah. spouses start to like wonder when they're, uh, they're, they can go back to work or, or, or their spouse leave the house, you know? <laughs> so, um, uh, well, well, would you mind um, ending off with, uh, uh, with a dua? Sure, so I can end with the short dua, inshallah. Our Sheikh, um, he used to finish every gathering with a very short dua, so I'll explain why it's very short. And that's that he would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah have mercy on us. And the reason for that, every uh, everybody would come with any illness, any issue, he would give the same dua. Someone asked him, Shaykh, everybody comes with different problems, he gives the same. Allah 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 So he explained it, and I think that's really interesting, the explanation. He said that that I, what I see in the world, in the, in the nature of this world, that when, when you've tried every means to get out of crime, right, and you've adopted every means, and you're, you're now appealing to the judge, you make that final appeal. What is that final appeal? You just appeal for mercy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so I think that, you know, inshallah ta'ala, uh, this appeal for mercy that we draw from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma arhamna, Allahumma arhamna, Allahumma arhamna, Allahumma shfi mardana, wa barada muslimin. More importantly and most importantly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah, have, have mercy on us, have mercy on us, have mercy on us. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Sayyidina Muhammad. لما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد وبارك على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم اغفر وارحم وأنت خير الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اغفر وارحم وأنت خير الراحمين اللهم اغفر وارحم وأنت خير الراحمين وصلي وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل وصحبه أجمعين يرحم تكلم يرحم الراحمين and we finish by touching our faces. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, you to, um, <laughs> uh, to, uh, to all of the listeners, and, um, and, and, and I know that there may be uh, many questions, uh, but we advise you to kind of uh, reach out to your local authorities to um, address any of those questions, um, or even to send emails to, uh, to Khalil Center, or I'm not sure if you guys take uh, email not very much. We'll, we'll take the emails, inshallah, and we'll try to get you um, the appropriate responses if needed, or we'll direct you to uh, resources. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.